May 1999, the most powerful tornado in history slams into Oklahoma City. Only one of 70 tornadoes in a massive outbreak. For 85 agonizing minutes, it scours the land across a path estimated at one mile wide and 38 miles long. It's just pure devastation, like somebody just dropped a bomb on our neighborhood. But what if that same tornado were to hit another city, a tornado magnet like Dallas, just 200 miles away, but six times bigger and six times more congested? It's going to kill people and blow buildings down and toss cars a mile down the road. History would be repeated, but this mega tornado would be five times more destructive. We're going to be seeing a major, major disaster here. And it's not a question of if, only a question of when. It will happen. Hello? It's just a matter of time. are more violent than the tornado. They swirl up to 318 miles per hour, packing a powerful 400-pound punch on every square foot of exposed surface. Major damage at the airport. It's leveled the entire building. And they can land without warning anywhere they choose. Late afternoon in Dallas, Texas, sometime in the near future. More than six million people live and work in the Metroplex, which includes Dallas, Fort Worth, and the surrounding suburbs. As many as 87,000 cars can be jammed on the freeways. Outside the city, a giant swirling thunderstorm is rolling in. Suddenly, the storm sprouts, a tornado. Look out, we're very close. Yes, yes, coming down right now, major tornado. This is not science fiction. This is a mega tornado. And scientists say it has an appointment with Dallas someday soon. Dallas residents need to take the threat seriously, basically because we know we're gonna have tornadoes. Now, scientific modeling and computer animation can bring one of these killers to life. This tornado has wind speeds of 300 miles an hour, will travel 40 to 50 miles on the ground over the period of about an hour. It will devour everything in its path. Cars will be lofted up into the air, trees will be debarked and stripped of branches, and houses will be flattened. Major damage at the airport, I repeat, major damage at the airport. From the suburbs, it heads for the freeways, where cars crowded in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic are directly in its path. Just ahead, Dealey Plaza, where President Kennedy was shot in 1963. With a tremendous roar, the Twister's 318 mile per hour winds sweep across the grassy knoll toward the Texas School Book Depository. And a second tragedy unfolds in this square. Just to the east, downtown Dallas's block of magnificent skyscrapers. Acres of glass on buildings hundreds of feet tall, glistening targets for the violence of the wind. Within seconds, half a million windows are blown out, creating a rain of deadly shards from shattered panes. Only a ghostly skeleton remains. Up to a thousand people are dead. No one will know how many for weeks. Finally, after traveling 38 miles, the tornado dissolves. Having a violent tornado in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is virtually inevitable. It will happen. It's just a matter of time. Dallas is one of the largest cities in Tornado Alley. This mega disaster is on its way, like the destruction of New Orleans and the certainty of a major earthquake in San Francisco. 
This is a scenario that planners fear. Regional Texas governments have a detailed computer study to calculate the damage a mega tornado would do to Dallas. You'll find at least 30,000 structures damaged. You'll see up to 60, 70, 80,000 people actually living in those paths. You'll see in some cases over 100,000 people working in those paths. Um, you'll see damages that could easily be at least four to five billion dollars in total just based on you know, what the structures are worth that are being hit. The recent record-setting hurricane season and the specter of global warming seem to up the odds that a mega tornado will strike. The annual all-time record for tornadoes was 1,819 in 2004. Strangely, 2005 had just 958. Winds are about 90 outside. The odds may change, but nature's house always wins. Understanding these unpredictable and elusive monsters is unimaginably difficult. We are trying to understand something that is fiendishly complex. Sometimes it's referred to as chaos. The real secret, the challenge that we confront is to find order amidst that chaos. This is a major tornado, significant proportions, wind speeds we don't know, but it's going to level most houses. To see the future for Dallas, we can look to the recent past in Oklahoma City. Oh my gosh. There, a mega tornado struck at rush hour on May 3rd, 1999. It still was gigantic. The 318 mile per hour winds are a world record, the most intense tornado ever measured. It mauls the earth for nearly 40 miles. The devastation is unbelievable. I didn't recognize my house when I was brought into the neighborhood. There were no points of reference. It was just one big mass of debris. The terrible storm leaves 43 people dead, and it becomes known as history's first billion-dollar tornado. It is a cautionary tale for Dallas and any other city inside Tornado Alley. The fact that, that this was such a devastating tornado is the result of it being a violent tornado going through a metropolitan area. But Oklahoma City is not a major metropolitan area. It's a good-sized city. But there are many other cities across the US that are much larger. And to have a violent tornado go through one of them in the future offers the potential for even greater devastation. Oh. Tornado Alley is home to a number of large cities. From St. Louis, to Omaha, to Kansas City, and more. The largest target of all is Dallas. The next mega tornado could strike any of them. And like the hurricane that destroyed New Orleans, it could plunge one of these cities into a mega disaster. Scientists say it is only a matter of time before a mega tornado hits a major city. For evidence, we can look at history and a super twister in 1999. It happened in Oklahoma City. As far as I'm concerned, the, the tornado event of May 3rd, 1999 was the most significant tornadic event I have ever seen and have ever witnessed or even seen pictures of. The storms producing the Oklahoma City mega tornado started around 4 o'clock p.m. Late afternoon is prime tornado time, when the heat of the long day accumulates in the atmosphere. Heat is the driving force in a thunderstorm. Hot air rises, creating motion in the air. Motion becomes wind, 
And if there's enough wind, the end result can be tornadoes. That day, Gary England, weathercaster for Oklahoma City's Channel 9, gave his first report at 4 p.m. Still fine, a little windy out of the north. Tendicator. It was like many, many other days. Conditions were favorable, it looked like, during the afternoon and evening and night for tornadic activity, but it looked like so many other days. We've seen the situation hundreds, if not thousands of times through the last 30 years. Oklahoma City is in Tornado Alley, a popular term for a band of high-risk areas running from Texas to North Dakota. It's where conditions combine most often to produce supercell thunderstorms. A supercell is essentially a rotating thunderstorm. It's rotating about a vertical axis. It looks like a, a bathtub vortex, if you will. Cross currents of air start the process, setting up a horizontal rotation in the atmosphere. Then warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico rises up, forcing the rotation into a vertical position. Cold air from Canada clashes with the warm, which rises, making its moisture condense into rain, and the storm spin intensifies the whole process. But amazingly, just how this rotation turns into a violent vortex we call a tornado remains a mystery. There are several thousand severe rotating thunderstorms that occur in the United States every year, but only about a quarter of them produce tornadoes. And we really don't know why. That day in Oklahoma City, forecasters watched the supercells carefully using Doppler radar, the primary tool for seeing inside the circling storms. But the giant radar domes of the National Weather Service have their limitations. Locked in fixed positions, they usually see storms only at a distance. And a scan with each full rotation takes six minutes, an eternity in the fast-moving world of tornadoes. What is that? Only the human eye can confirm a twister's contact with the ground. Tornado chasers see the first at 4.30 p.m. And for the next 11 hours, one tornado after another strikes the landscape. Major tornado. We have a large tornado on the ground. This is tornado number six or something. As the tornadoes come down, Professor Josh Worman is on the road, chasing the twister with his mobile radar truck, Doppler on wheels. Unlike fixed radar towers, this Doppler can go anywhere, anytime to confront a tornado face to face. Worman hopes his research will result in better tornado forecasting for the future. We're trying to observe tornadoes from close up, and that means we need to be exactly where the tornadoes are. You're gonna, you're gonna get him on a roof. The chasers target the trailing edge of the storm. Strong, high-level winds blow the rain miles away to the front of the supercell. Most of the real action is at the rear of the storm, where the high-speed updraft sucks air in. Here is where the rotation is strongest. This is tornado country. Another scientist on the chase is Chuck Doswell. He's a meteorologist at the National Severe Storms Laboratory. I've been chasing for 30 years, and, and I knew right away that it was something very dramatic. I'm just north of Chickasha on the interstate. What a storm. Chickasha is 40 miles southwest of Oklahoma City. The tornado here is rated at F2. Two miles west northwest of Chickasha. It lasts nine minutes, unusual for a tornado. Most of them fizzle after a minute or two. And another more powerful tornado touches down moments later. The dark, massive wedge immediately dominates the landscape. Every one of the chasers who pursues it is astounded. For Chuck Doswell, the danger is clear. I'll tell you what, Oklahoma City is about to get hammered. Now, the most destructive tornado in history is barreling down the highway. And Oklahoma City lies dead ahead. Yeah, I hope this doesn't go to Oklahoma City. It's going to be strong. Deadliest tornadoes in U.S. history. Tri-state, 625 dead. 
Natchez, Mississippi, 317. St. Louis, Missouri, 255. Dallas, Texas is in a danger zone. The largest city in a state ranking number one in the country for number, deaths, injuries, and property damage from tornadoes. A mega twister in Dallas would take that ranking into uncharted territory. That tornado would look very much like the one that struck nearby Oklahoma City on May 3rd, 1999. By 6.20, 11 tornadoes have already hit, but now a monster comes crashing down. Huge. It is the 100th tornado to hit Oklahoma City in a century of record keeping. It's the biggest one of all. It was an emotional roller coaster. You know, it was obviously this thing was going to kill people, and there was nothing we could do about it except warn the people. Experienced chasers describe tornadoes by their shapes. A stovepipe tornado, stout with straight sides. A rope tornado, slender and sinuous, usually taking this form in its late stages. But this mega tornado in Oklahoma City is called a wedge, wider than it is tall. This shape, with more contact with the ground, tends to be more destructive. And this wedge is enormous, up to a mile wide. It's a great big wedge. It went into that wedge mode, and it stayed in that mode for at least 20 to 30 minutes. I've never seen a storm do that before. Fantastic experience. It's now 6.23 p.m. The Doppler on Wheels trucks deployed by meteorologist Josh Worman scan the storm with their radar dishes. The colorful displays paint a complex picture of the twister's internal structure. So you want to get to its northeast and then uh, try and deploy. And we're going to go north and smack. One of the Doppler's readouts is the reflectivity display. Radar beams bounced off the storm to show its shape. The other readout is the velocity display, showing the speed of the winds, absolutely vital in understanding tornadoes. The areas of green and blue represent winds that are coming towards the radar, which is sitting right up here. The areas of brown and red indicate winds going away from the radar. In the case of a tornado, which is a circular motion going counterclockwise, we see very strong, intense, these blue velocities going towards the radar on the right side. And on the left side, we see very strong, very intense winds going away from the radar on the left side. During the storm, Wurman's Doppler display shows a tiny spot of color in the center, revealing an astonishing fact. The area of brown represents winds that are well over 200 miles an hour. In a jet going into the tornado, right on this area here, we see an area of red, a contiguous area of five separate radar measurements with winds approaching and exceeding 300 miles an hour. So this area here represents the strongest winds that we measured, in fact, that anyone's ever measured. The preliminary data shows a wind speed of 318 miles per hour at the very top of the F5 range. No greater wind speed has ever been recorded by anyone. Damn, that's a monster. Some observers believe the tornado is up to a mile wide, but appearances can be deceiving. This simulation from the University of West Virginia shows why. The center of the tornado's column of wind is outlined by a funnel of condensed water inside it. But when it churns up debris, it looks much larger to an observer on the ground. To those watching a mega tornado like the one in Oklahoma City, it makes a bad situation seem that much worse. Whoa, whoa! Oh, big time, Black. Whoa, yeah. wow. Is, is, is it going, uh... I see debris flying, a big piece of debris flying through the air. The tornado collides with electric lines, creating bright power flashes. At Oklahoma City's Channel 9, the drama is played out live as weathercaster Gary England and storm spotters track the big tornado. 
it was surreal for me. It was like it was a movie, yet we were part of the movie because we were looking at live video of this tornado. I'm talking to our meteorologists in the field. I'm looking at radar. Holy cow, you're looking at this thing and it's, it's getting ready to move through your city, your town, and affect your people. You folks the path this storm have time to get below ground. You need to be below ground with this storm. This is a deadly tornado. Rick and Teresa Isbell are among those hearing England's warning. The tornado is headed toward their home. I grew up in the Panhandle, Texas, and here in Oklahoma, and I've been, I've seen a lot of tornadoes. Uh, I've been known to sit in my lawn chair in the front yard with my glass tea and watch them go by. I, they never concerned me that much. But this one here was so, getting so big, and it was not bouncing around. It really got my attention. Getting ready to cross the river, uh, crossing the South Canadian River near Southwest 149th Street. The TV broadcast shows the twister is just four miles away from the Isbell's home. I knew where it was headed, and that's when I decided to, to bail out of here and take off. Their only hope is to reach the home of Rick's aunt, who has a storm cellar in her backyard. He was driving like a maniac, and I told him, I said, if you don't slow down, you're going to kill us before the tornado does. Nearby, other residents also ready to seek shelter have their video cameras rolling as the tornado approaches. Yeah, it's headed right at me. I got it in my camera view. It's headed right in front of me. And I'm fixing to go for cover. With only a few minutes to spare, the Isbells make it to Rick's aunt's house and their waiting storm cellar, just as the tornado passes nearby. What we didn't know was our area had been hit. The twister slashes first through the Isbell's neighborhood in southwest Oklahoma City, and then through neighboring Moore, where some of the worst damage occurs. It's coming through the city of Moore right now. Hundreds of homes are flattened. Westmore High School takes a major hit, and a two-story metal church building is completely destroyed. The largest projectile is a steel tank tossed 900 feet and a bathtub with a woman hiding inside is hurled 300 feet. Incredibly, she rides the distance and survives. In another 15 minutes, the tornado roars north through Tinker Air Force Base, where it starts to lose steam. I might have time. I don't see it. I think it might be gone. The horror ends at 7.48 p.m. as the tornado dissipates in Dell City just five miles from downtown Oklahoma City. An average tornado's two-minute lifetime leaves a damage path two miles long, 50 yards wide. But this one had remained on the ground for 85 minutes, scoring the earth with an ugly scar 38 miles long and up to a mile wide. It was actually stripping the grass down to the bare red Oklahoma dirt. And the scour mark that it left looked like there were, you know, 10,000 herd of buffalo marching on through. It literally scoured the landscape. When the counting is done, 43 people are dead. 795 are injured. Remarkably low numbers given the magnitude of the tornado outbreak. The reason that tornado didn't kill a large number of people, I believe, is good warnings. But while people can take shelter, a city cannot. May 3rd, 1999 leaves Oklahoma City with 2,314 homes destroyed, 7,478 damaged, and the cost, $1.2 billion. It was just kind of a shock. It looked, it was just pure devastation, like somebody just dropped a bomb on our neighborhood, this leveled the whole neighborhood. This disaster was only a rehearsal, a best case scenario. But what if a mega tornado decides to strike at a different time and in a different place? Rogue nature is supremely indifferent to the best laid plans of man. And what is worse, those plans may not even exist. Dallas is in the heart of Tornado Alley. Will it be ready when the worst goes down?
This may be the future of Dallas, Texas, if the experts are right. And they already have their first case study. 200 miles up the road in Oklahoma City, this is what was left when a massive twister struck in 1999. Here, houses intended to last a lifetime were blown to pieces in seconds. Conventional housing is built to a building code, and that building code states that you have to build to a 90 mile per hour, three second gust. But what building code can protect us from a killer wind three times more powerful, such as the 318 mile per hour vortex that struck Oklahoma City? The damage left behind by this mega wind, history's costliest tornado, has special meaning for Tim Marshall, a Dallas-Fort Worth area resident. For Tim, lives at the wrong address. The last time Dallas got hit with a major tornado was in 1957. And that tornado, on a scale, compared to what happened in Oklahoma City, was piddly. If you're talking about a big F5 tornado that's a mile wide, that can cover the entire Metroplex, we're going to be seeing a major, major disaster here. What could such a tornado do to Dallas? It's a case where size matters. Dallas has more to lose in a mega tornado because it has more to destroy. That's why Scott Ray and a team of computer analysts in Dallas are trying to second guess ruthless nature. Essentially, you're talking about neighbors that saw this kind of event and it demonstrated that you're not really off limits by being in an urban area. Ray has led a detailed computer study of the damage the 1999 Oklahoma City tornado would do if it were to strike Dallas. This giant metroplex is packed with targets of destructive opportunity. Six million people, one million homes, 60,000 commercial buildings. This computer modeling begins with the data collected by scientists like Tim Marshall and Chuck Doswell. After the Oklahoma City tornado, each took part in surveys, carefully photographing the tornado's damage and cataloging each building within the F0 to F5 range of the Fujita scale. The scale was created in 1967 by University of Chicago professor Ted Fujita. It estimates the wind speed of a tornado by the destruction it leaves behind on a range from F0 to F5. In terms of housing, here's how the F scale works. F0 is loss of some shingles and some things like antennas, chimneys. With F1, you're gonna be losing part of the roof. We're talking about some decking. With F2, you lose the entire roof. With F3, you're losing the roof and exterior walls. With F4, only the center walls are remaining standing. And in F5, it's completely gone. The F numbers from the Oklahoma City Damage Survey are used to create maps. A U.S. Air Force photo of the damage track is the template. The F scale damage is posted for each house surveyed. And then it's just a matter of connecting the dots to create a detailed map of the tornado's path of destruction. The color coding is a cold clinical illustration of the massive total devastation radiating out from the center, fading at the edges. Now Oklahoma City disappears, and suddenly Dallas appears, ready for its rendezvous with a mega disaster. What if it strikes here? Or here? Or here? The fact that the damage total and the number of people at risk, the traffic at risk could be, you know, four to five times higher than anything that we've seen up to this point was, was pretty, uh, a pretty intense data set to, to take in. Bottom line in this worst case scenario is damage in Dallas totaling nearly $5 billion. Dallas area emergency services will be taxed to their limits. A thousand bodies may have to be dug from the wreckage. The 112 hospitals in the Metroplex may be flooded with 15,000 injuries. 
Dallas-Fort Worth Airport is the third busiest in the world. If the tornado strikes here, the entire planet's air traffic system could be disrupted. The power flashes seen during the Oklahoma City tornado represent downed electric towers and severed cables. If this happens in Dallas, emergency repair crews may take days or weeks to restore power. Can this grim scenario be prevented? Or is Dallas to be a victim of catastrophic circumstance? There is a myth that you cannot build a home to resist a tornado. It is not possible to build a home economically to resist F4 and F5 intensity winds. But only a small fraction of the path ever experiences those winds. Most houses are hit by F3 winds or below. Here, some houses stand up better than others. Those left standing are the ones built using stronger joints than their weaker neighbors. A worker demonstrates how the sill plate is nailed to a typical house foundation using common narrow cut nails. Let me show you how deep this cut nail actually goes into the slab foundation. If you look down here, as this head gets driven down in here, you only get about a half an inch of penetration into the slab. A tornado could rip out this sill in the blink of an eye. Look what happened here when the cut nail is actually pulled out of the foundation. It broke off a piece like this, just lying like that with a huge area here out of the slab. Now this is what we see time and time again after tornadoes that hit houses. The conclusion is clear. Strengthen the joints that hold houses together. Cost-effective solutions include bolts to attach the sill to the foundation. The roof, another weak point in many houses, is made more wind resistant by nailing it to the frame with hurricane clips. These 49 cent pieces of hardware could keep the roof from flying off in tornadoes, as well as the hurricanes for which they are named. Flying debris complicates the problem. A tornado is invisible unless it is filled with either condensed water vapor, which makes it white, or with debris, which turns it dark. It's bad enough when forceful winds do their damage to property, but debris makes things worse. A poorly built house will throw off debris that can damage a sturdier house downstream. Water tanks, bathtubs, bricks, pipes, and lumber are wind-driven battering rams, blowing away houses that might otherwise survive. Because windborne debris is such a major factor in damage analysis, researchers at Texas Tech University have developed a special instrument called the Debris Impact Cannon to study it. Clear. Three, two, one. I earned my degrees from Texas Tech. And of course, one of the things that we do is we have this cannon and we shoot boards through walls. And it demonstrates quite clearly that you need to have some pretty good protection on your walls. A 15-pound 2x4 traveling 100 miles per hour is the most common kind of tornado debris. And that's what the cannon is built to fire. Well, the 2x4, everybody is pretty familiar with. And we've seen a number of examples where 2x4s go through things. They go through the roof deck. They go through brick walls. I've even seen them go through refrigerators. So the 2x4 is a fairly common building material, and we do see it flying around a lot. The debris impact cannon is also used to test building materials, especially those used in safe rooms designed to protect people inside their houses during tornadoes. Safe rooms are generally made of reinforced masonry, jacketed with a thick steel frame, so solid and so strong that they are impervious to debris driven by two and 300 mile an hour winds. But what if you have no safe room? Then you need to be told where to go by weather forecasters. 
miles per hour temperatures. Using a combination of radar, satellites, instant communications, and supercomputers, modern forecasters continue to increase warning times. Steady winds, 10 miles per hour. The average lead time over the last several years has now increased to 13 to 15 minutes for a tornado warning. That's just enough time to get to a safe place, even if it's only the innermost room of your home. As these wrecked neighborhoods show, time and again, the inner rooms usually survive. In Oklahoma City, people expected and heeded the warnings. In other major cities, these warnings that the sky is falling may not register. I tend to believe that the people in Dallas are not as prepared as the people in Oklahoma City. But employing the science of computer animation, we may be shocked into awareness as an F-5 strikes Dallas in a disaster movie that could become all too real. Damage from the three costliest tornadoes in U.S. history ranged from $821 million to $1.2 billion. Dallas, Texas. Moist air from the south is jetting skyward into the chilly upper atmosphere, forming a classic supercell thunderstorm. It is May when these warm and cool air masses collide most often. The storm has not yet reached the city itself, and the skies are still clear. But not clear enough. These skies are about to darken. Now, using the latest research, expert predictions, and computer animation, we will show the human toll of that darkness. I don't know if it'll be this year, or five years, or 10 years, but eventually an F5, a 300 mile per hour, half mile wide is going to come to the Dallas-Fort Worth area and it's going to kill people and blow buildings down and toss cars a mile down the road. Oh! The inevitable happens. Just as a similar storm generated the giant 1999 twister in Oklahoma City, this storm drops a tornado. Winds begin to scream at half the speed of sound. This predatory fury approaching the city is worse than most people can imagine. The force of the wind goes up as the square of the wind speed. Now what that means is that if the wind gets twice as strong, the force you feel goes up four times. If it gets four times as strong, the force goes up 16 times. The tornado's 300 mile per hour winds are nearly 20 times more powerful than any of the natural forces in ordinary human experience. What? Oh my, oh, my God. Oh, my God. The entire city of Dallas now stands exposed to the mega winds of this mega tornado. Following atmospheric weather flow, most tornadoes travel from southwest to northeast. Meteorologists expect this would be no different. As it bears down on Dallas, the western edge of downtown is straight ahead. Suddenly, its most famous landmark is dangerously exposed. The former Texas School Book Depository, the site of the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. It is directly in the path of the tornado's howling 950-foot ring of 318 mile per hour winds. The cars passing by on Elm Street may become deadly missiles. When we have winds of 300 miles an hour, cars levitate. They actually become airborne in that kind of a wind stream and can roll and tumble and be lofted up two and three stories up into the book depository. And we can have the brick masonry around the building actually collapse. The mammoth twister hurtles toward the city's crown, a jeweled corridor of splendid steel and glass skyscrapers. 16 of them more than 40 stories high. Perhaps the most distinctive is I.M. Pei's Fountain Place, a giant 60-story prism studded with 26,000 panes of glass, 26,000 potential weapons. Well, if we have an F5 tornado hitting downtown Dallas, we're going to see a lot of glass everywhere. Buildings will be looking like dollhouses because they'll just be empty shelves. 
The wind will blow through the building from one end to the other, taking furniture, desks, computers right on out the other side. The massive frame of steel girders is strong enough to stand up to any tornado and would remain intact. But its glass skin may be obliterated with those glass shards slicing through the air below. A deadly variation of what happens to strong trees in the suburbs, where trunks and main branches often survive while leaves and bark are stripped away. A mile and a half to the east is the famous Cotton Bowl, built in 1932, where we see 65,000 seats. Tim Marshall sees a killing field. Here we have an aerial view of the Cotton Bowl. I'm sitting right about here. And this red circle depicts the radius of maximum winds of our tornado that's about 0.18 miles wide. And as it moves off to the northeast here, it's going to take these seats that you see here that are blue and white and mix them all together as it rotates around over my head. Can you imagine if this stadium was packed full of people? The sign up to my right here would be hit broadside by the wind and actually be folded down to the left. That speaker tower you see in the background there, that would actually fall on down into the stands. The good news is this. The Cotton Bowl was built with reinforced concrete, and the underlying structure will survive. The bad news is that anyone who can't get to shelter under the stands in time is in mortal danger. This is one of the biggest fears that I have, is that one of these days, a large tornado is going to go across an area like an arena or a large venue, and there's going to be a lot of people injured and killed. Could we get to 1,000 fatalities? I think we can. We could get to a thousand death toll in a tornado. As the tornado moves northeast, Dallas housing also takes a terrible hit. The tornado would grind through residential neighborhoods, gouging out a groove of destruction. Houses built with cut nail construction to withstand 90 mile per hour winds would be blown away by these killer blasts. Reduced to splinters by flying two by fours cars would be tossed like toys. These already extreme winds get an additional boost from the twister's forward speed of 35 miles per hour. At 318 miles per hour, it is already at the upper limit of the F5 range. Add an extra 35, and it theoretically becomes an F6. Now, could you tell the difference in terms of the damage and the effects it produces and the answer is almost certainly not. So if a house is blown away by an F5 tornado, it's going to be blown away by an F6 tornado, and there won't be anything left in both cases. When the tornado in Dallas finally ends, the butcher's bill comes due. 1,000 people dead, 15,000 injured, 30,000 buildings leveled, 40,000 homeless, and $5 billion in total damage. Recovery may take weeks or months, but this city will never be the same. And though all of this could come to pass, the odds are still in our favor. The odds of your home being hit by a tornado, and especially by the F4 or F5 winds of a violent tornado, are really small perhaps in any given year on the order of one in a million. On the other hand, the odds don't do you much good if you have a tornado bearing down on you. We have seen what happens when we don't beat the odds. With Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans gambled and lost. Dallas, St. Louis, Kansas City, and all the cities in Tornado Alley could well be dealt their share of tragedy too. But they can strengthen their hand by tightening building codes and educating the public to have a plan for shelter when the big one hits. This is one game that they cannot afford to lose. <laughs>